Of course, toast. Got to have a bit of toast. Postman Pat. Okay, so I've caved. It's only half past nine in the morning, but I've got to start off the holiday right. <laughs> there we are. Boarding the bastard. <laughs> KLM City Hopper. I don't want it to hop, <laughs> I want it to fly. I don't know if they're showing up either, but uh, wind farms, baby. Oh yeah, the plane's moving around for him. Cheers, buddy. Wind farms, baby. Go have a look at these pizzas because it's like a pizza buffet and they're absolutely gorgeous let's have a look at these a look at this restaurant it's absolutely beautiful in here check these out beautiful pizzas if only i could get the smell across on here absolutely beautiful i'm running out of battery but hopefully i can get a little bit of my steak when it comes Ah, now actually, I ended that prematurely. I wanted to take a little look around here. And look at what, uh, where we are. Just how close we are right here to this uh, beautiful waterside where all of the boats are that we saw earlier when I would have been doing my uh, time-lapse thing. It's just right here, right where the restaurant is. We've got an absolutely beautiful view from, uh, from where we're sat. I don't know if you can... There's mountains and everything, if I can try and get a good shot of this. Over there, this is basically what we see while we eat. There's this beautiful street with mountains right at the back there. Absolutely gorgeous. So, blogging from a toilet, I don't know if this is the done thing. In fact, I think it's especially not done in any kind of blogs or travel logs or anything like that. But I'm in the toilet right now. I'm gonna make our way over to get a drink in a minute. Just had a great chat with Jero and Matt Gray and actually Rob Hubbard showed up. But I didn't just wanna shove a camera in their face, you know what I mean? Um, it, it seemed so rude. So I'm gonna try and touch base with them again at some point throughout this evening. Uh, Rob and Matt are playing live tomorrow night. 
So we might just be able to get some more footage tomorrow night. Uh, maybe chat to him outside having a cigarette or something like that. Uh, I know we'll catch Jerome at some point, definitely. So we'll see what's going on. But for now, inside the toilet, waiting for a drink. Just started, yeah. The yep. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. You've not missed it, mate. <laughs>
Okay, I think this is Robocop. Give us some Robocop, baby. Come on, Robocop 3.
crack out. Uh, the, the, the oh, no, not that crack out. That's the thing. But, um, I really like the music and I uh, think it's uh, nice to play in front of you. Uh, hope you can enjoy this. And Cork, turn it up. Give me the full volume here. say it starts at six um, yet where is the poster gone and here I don't know if you can see that it says six o'clock Friday like 15 is that Lordag that means Saturday Th uh, three o'clock Saturday so yeah we're a little bit confused at the moment so we managed to get in it turned out that it was going on there's lots of stuff going on at the moment it's just chilled out it's called Commodore Cafe and they're basically just playing tunes as you can probably hear in the background I don't even know if you'll be able to hear me over it actually uh, but yeah it's just chilling out listening to tunes there's gonna be a remix competition soon which is interesting we're gonna hopefully try and get some of that the interview with Rob at 8 followed by Fast Loaders featuring Rob and I believe Matt Gray too I might be wrong on that Matt Gray's involved in the interview I forgot about that um, so we're going to hang out at this Commodore Cafe for a little bit and probably get some dinner and then make sure that we're back for the interview. Um, so yeah, let's have a quick look around. This is what the Commodore Cafe is like right now. Commodore 64 Cafe is going well, it's lovely in there, just big fans of C64 Music Hall chilling out and chatting. There's one guy who's non-stop dancing, he's absolutely brilliant and we're going to uh, try and talk to him later on, get a little quick interview with him. There are a few fans I'd like to chat to, get some interstitial bits and see why they're here, their history with C64, things like that. That's the kind of thing I'd like to get. 
So we need to capture them as they come out. We're still hoping to catch Giro and Tell. He's here at the moment. Um, Rob was here a minute ago, but he's left. And hopefully we can catch him and Matt Gray later on in the evening. Um, I just played uh, Super Mario on the Commodore 64. It's incredibly impressive. Um, Shell is right here behind the camera. You don't. You're kind of new to all this stuff. Um, and anyone who might be watching this who's new to all this stuff, that's kind of helpful. So, you know, Super Mario wasn't available on the Commodore 64, and that's right. why it's impressive. Yeah. In fact, it comes from a console that's f fairly later than the Commodore 64. So, okay. someone has programmed a version of uh, Super Mario Brothers, which works actually astoundingly. Um, I played it all the way up to World 5 using the Warp Zone, of course, and it was working absolutely fine i've been a mario fan my whole life it was really impressive stuff i asked the guy who had it set up what the history of it was and where it had come from who had programmed it how old it was whether it was modern but he didn't really have any information on it um he said he had no idea um, and apparently it is an old thing and is just out of print now so super mario brothers on the commodore 64 maybe i'll be able to capture a bit more of that if they've still got it going on when we come in from this cigarette So you've known me as Bruce. Yeah, yeah. and I've, I've, you, you have known me as Dean. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so we are Bruce and Dean yes. for the moment. Just for now. Just for um, now. So, what's even brought you here today? Um, you must be a fan of this stuff going long back. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. Uh, it, it was very special to me because these are actually two events. I have to, I have to thank Chris Abbott uh, later on because I was a fan of his CDs early on. Mm -hmm. I, I like to have the, these CDs, you know, real CDs. And mm -hmm. I collected a lot of these back in time CDs and stuff he did produce. And this year was very special because uh, I went to the orchestral event in Hull, the, mm -hmm. the 8 bit symphony, with, <laughs> with our daughter, uh, and we relived our, her childhood, our experiences together mm -hmm. through this event. It was very special to me, and then this follow up happened because I got to meet people as mm -hmm. it usually happens yeah and uh, um, yeah and I met Bart you know who was organizing back in time live in Bergen and yeah and one thing led to another and <laughs> I, I, I in fact that's how it came to be that I, I hear it all <laughs> and uh, I, I even produced this theremin remix to mm, take part in in this event at least a bit Mm -hmm. So and then it's just of course it's it's they are totally different these two events mm -hmm. this year but they both were very very exciting and very yeah. it was very close to my heart because yeah as uh, a lot of you people know it's if you experience this in your childhood the music especially the sit music Absolutely. it stays with you it, it touches something and you. You ju I just, for example, if, if, I, if I hear the track from, one of the tracks from Flimbo's Quest, uh, uh, it just makes me mm -hmm. immensely happy and feel warm inside. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you've mentioned this remix competition and, and the theremin stuff, Now yeah. I want to get to that because that's, that's great stuff. But also, you mentioned your daughter. I, yes. I, actually, I have to assume that she wasn't born at the time of the C64. No, she was she was born like okay, nineteen eighty two. Then C sixty four C sixty four came out, and she was born in two thousand and two. So so actually she was born twenty years after. Yes. The C sixty four came out. So so that's that's my point. Like because because I'm quite young and I wasn't born at the time of the C sixty four. Yes. I, I wanted to talk about that element of, of how it is quite timeless and how you, I, you don't actually have to have been born in the 80s to love this stuff. No, no, in no way, because she immediately found the games fun to play, mm -hmm. despite there being a lot of uh, other distractions, yes, you know, and yes. more modern stuff, uh, and the music uh, in her, you know, from when she was from 8 until 14, 15, this was, 
she even did a bit of DJing herself mm. with this stuff. Oh, that's and, great. And, and so it's not a matter of age or when you were born. This speaks for the inherent quality of these games and this music. Of course, in comparison for the most eyes and ears of people, it's it can be crude, you know, but, mm. but, but if you're a child and you're open, you get touched by it. Yes, it happens. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about this CD then. Um, okay. Let's show it up to the um, camera. Yeah. Theremin Land. <laughs> yeah, that's... <laughs> Uh, yeah. Now, no, this is fascinating because we've had this great uh, remix competition today. It was where, great. Yeah, 15 different remixes of uh, C64 music, and, and we've been talking about how they were all good. Oh, uh, yes. yes. And they were all different. That was the fun thing about it. Yes. For, ranging from, you know, you were saying heavily dubstep and things like that, onto just a p piano on its own and things like yes. that. And they, they were all good for their own reasons. And, and you were one of the 15 with this theremin uh, remix. Yes. <laughs> yes, and, and it was absolutely brilliant. So, so could, you, could you detail a little bit about the song you chose, why you chose it, and, and some of the things you might have had to do to adapt it? To yes, it? yeah, of course. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, yeah, um, actually, I, I talked to Rob Harbour just about an hour ago or something, or an hour and a half ago. Uh, I always thought, I could hear a theremin in his music for Warhawk mm -hmm. uh, uh, because you know he can he oh, he's a genius with the sit chip and he already did back then things that sounded like violin like 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 a accordion or a guitar solo mm -hmm. and I always heard that uh, but he just confirmed it was not actually in his mind but mm -hmm. that's that's the, the beauty of all this old chip music and pixel graphics that you have to invest and you yes. have to put your fantasy and subjectivity into it and you yeah that's that's missing now because everything you are passive now as a viewer as a partner as a recipient and yeah and that's why I chose Warhawk in the first place and a couple of other, I did a couple of other melody lines and I ended with, you know, of course with the high score of one commando mm -hmm. just to, yeah, to round it off. But the, fun, the real fun fact is, to cut a long story short, uh, I use a stomp box, a loop sampler, to, because the theremin is a monophonic instrument normally. Um, and I begin monophonically and I end in with a solo but in, in my performances, but in between, of course, if I'm not doing uh, an act with another musician, I'll add on the theremin to get other voices with the stomp box. And this, this is an old Line 6, uh, it's, it's, uh, I think it's a retro now already because <laughs> modern stuff is much smaller and has much more mem memory, but this one just holds 14 seconds. So I chose a section of Warhawk in between that would fit in there. And the funny thing is, it's only three bars. So uh, I, I got, I heard, a, I got a comment that somebody liked it just for the fact that I broke the rhythm with it, with it because everything else is like four bars and four beats, mm -hmm. everything. And I had three bars and each of these bars has six <laughs> beats. <laughs> so that's the, the, one of the reasons was that it's 14, 14 seconds in this stomp box. But the other reason is that you can play these theremin-like lines over these six beats and, and it, it's just more interesting mm -hmm. to do so. And at the Monty, uh, not Monty, the um, Commando High School over, over these odd meters. So um, that's th these, this, these, these inspirations and things just came to me one day before the, really one day before the flight. I recorded it mm -hmm. one day before and at five in the morning I did the I put it together roughly, so that's why I call it a, a dirty mix. <laughs> but yeah, so that's roughly the story about it. Mm. But uh, interestingly, uh, Theremin Land is not a video game music album. No, and no, it, no. And no, as no. you mentioned earlier, opens with actually a rendition of the Brazil. Yes, thing. yes, yeah, it's, it's uh, basically, it doesn't say so anywhere, but mm. basically it's a best off of from my stuff, uh, like from uh, around... 12 years or something, so it's yeah from nearly my whole theremin career up until now. It is, it's a completely mixed bag because you have live performances with a trumpet player who does trumpet to MIDI. It's 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 got it got these Brazil variations, 
combined with Gershwin. That's mm -hmm. why it's called Brazil Watch Over Me. <laughs> of course. And, and, yes. Yeah, yeah. And I have got happy birthday variations because there was a, an event with our mayor even. That he was in attendance where they were celebrating a, a, a birthday of an institution. And then there's a very a, a dear friend of mine who is into modern electronic music and he did a, he did a march with sound effects in the woods with footsteps right. and stuff. And he wanted the theremin to, to he wrote, he, he really wrote a score for the theremin. Yeah, so this is a very mixed bag, unfo a mixed bag. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not, no, there's not, no dedicated 8-bit track on there because yeah, that's what happens now yes. and what, <laughs> yes. what ha what's, what's happening in between. I, I did one, I think, purely C64 and two minutes of especially composed by me, uh, uh, music for the C64 combined with theremin, also with this dear friend of oh, mine. Wow. But oh. it's not on there, <laughs> but, uh, but a lot of stuff is, which is quite unique, yeah. There's, there's one thing I did uh, for a... Uh, I did the 2D, uh, 2D half 3D animation for this myself, right. Intersphere, yeah, and it, it was an art project, and I also did the music, so that it really fits the animation. The, it's online, so if you look up Martin Lund and Intersphere, you, you can watch the whole thing, it's a, an, an animation mm -hmm. based on a sculpture of a friend, and yeah, and everything together, so mm -hmm. that's what I like to do. <laughs> So finally, you mentioned this thing about um, actually com uh, putting the theremin with Commodore 64 music that you've yes. written. Uh, if people wanted to find that, what, what could they search for? Where could they find it? Just for myself as well. Um, like yeah, you could you could poke around the Martin Land. That's uh, Theremin Land is in fact a, a sub page of my Martin Land mm -hmm. page, which is really retro. I'm really I, I, retro for me is a lifestyle and a philo philosophy even. And don't don't be shocked or afraid. The the page does look its age because I'm very proud of it. I'm like a rock, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the in the in the in the sea of time. Yeah, <laughs> and right. I, I kept my email and I kept my page since like yeah, nearly 20 years now. Mm -hmm. And and you can find snippets of all this on my Theremin Land Martin yes. Land page. And uh, ah, one thing I forgot to mention, but it's yeah, there are snippets of that on there too. This is one other reason I forgot to mention why I got here and uh, with the theremin there. I did uh, several 8-bit disco events. Mm. That's where I got the, the idea from that where I just played, you know, like Glenn Gallefoss does with his Commodore Cafe. I just played tracks on the real Commodore 64 and played live, mm -hmm. played to, with the theremin I improvised to it. Right, right. And these were sets like, uh, yeah, 30, 40 minute sets. And maybe I can revive it, or that's what I was talking about with the people here and in how maybe I can revive that. Because yeah. it was sets with the Commodore 64, one of the uh, yeah most influential home computers, and with the Theremin, one of the first, if not the first, uh, synthesizer mm -hmm. and odd instruments at that, <laughs> and combined. So this was 8-bit disco events I did with mm. these. This, with this combination, so that sounds incredible. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd love to see something like that. And I, I can see this stuff growing. Yeah, Absolutely. hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, uh, yeah hopefully, because because it takes the next couple of generations to get on the train as well. <laughs> but but that's how we started by saying, you know, I wasn't born at the time of the Commodore sixty four. Neither was your daughter. Yeah, and we're still absolutely in love with it. So it, it's going it's to marvelous. continue. Yeah, it's going to continue. Right. So Martin, thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. So now we reveal. I'm Martin and you're Lee. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. So we are Bruce Lee and Dean Martin. No? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So now Thank we're, you, yeah. we're going to go and dance, I think, now, probably. We are going where? Going to go dance. Yes, we are going to dance. Yes, yeah, so going that's to... what's one of my passions too, as you yes. realized. Yeah, we're going to dance now. Right. We have to celebrate. Right. Thank you for having me. And No problem, it's been great. This was nice. Yes, excellent. Thank you. Let's dance. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I read another story, <laughs> which is even weirder, that the you know, guy had his, uh, his, you know, cow, uh, his farm automated for 
milking, milk mm. machine or something in the yeah. stables of the for the cows, and he had a uh, C64 controlling this, yeah. <laughs> and it, it kept on running for I don't know, uh, I can't remember how many <laughs> years. Yeah. And, and this it's is an un and it's in Austria where yeah. you have winter and snow yeah. like here, really extreme, and a warm summer, and it's an unheated you know place, and this thing kept working. Because I think the the, 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 the main thing because uh, it kept working was not only because it's yeah it's a sturdy thing it was a rare it was just a rare occasion yeah. this C64 and it's <laughs> so big no, it components was, inside and it, so and moisture you know the vape that yeah 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 that that it's vapes on, <laughs> yeah. It, they are so tiny yeah but, but, but in a modern computer if you get a tiny drop short thing. Yeah, circuit. it's, it, it's it, done. It, affecting everything. But yeah. inside a Commodore, everything yeah. is uh, but, a through hole mounted, big components. That's so, true. So but it the, takes a lot of water. But the, one of the main <laughs> reasons, I think, anything. is that he kept it running yeah. all year yeah, long day and night. because <laughs> there was no thermal stress yeah. on the components whatsoever. Yeah. If he would have turned it off and on every day, in the winter, you know, from yeah. complete cold, yeah. then I think it would yeah. break so very it just soon. Keeps but its own it was, and yeah, and just, it's uh, evaporating yeah. all the moisture. Ah. Yeah, that is amazing, isn't <laughs> it? Amazing? There's my boy, Edward Grieg, incredible composer and Bergen's most famous son. Um, unfortunately, it turns out his house, at least I think it was his house, or a historical building tied to him, is really quite far away. And there's no way that we can get there today, which is a shame. I'd have really liked to see that as a music fan. And there's also another building, I believe it's pronounced Bregen, Bregen, uh, something like that, which is a very important historical building that we haven't been able to see. Um, in fact, I think we have seen it, but with uh, some construction up around it, which is a bit of a bummer. Uh, but yeah, there's a few key monuments and things that we haven't been able to see. But this is a busy, busy city in terms of culture and life. And we've only had a few days and well, the video game easy to think about. Lovely bandstand here too. This is a gorgeous area. So it's a shame that there's a little bit of construction going on here. Because otherwise this would be absolutely gorgeous. I imagine that that's a... Uh, an art gallery over there <clears throat> which I'd have liked to have had a look at again if we'd have had more time we'd have gone into these places museums aquariums things like this it's a really really nice uh, massive pond lake thing going on over there and uh, we'll have a good look at that now I'll turn the camera off and then we'll jump cut over there so here we have uh, Christian Mitchelson, Michelson, not entirely sure how to pronounce the Norwegian names properly, uh, but this guy is an extremely prominent figure in uh, Norwegian uh, political history. And it turns out that uh, anyone in England, Great Britain, will know about the United Kingdom, the UK, of England, Wales, Scotland, etc. But back in 1905, before 1905, there was actually a United Kingdom of Sweden and Norway. They were a united kingdom. Um, but tensions were rising between the two parties towards war. There were preludes to war, huge political tensions. And Christian Michelson, Michelson, was a huge prominent figure in uh, Norway attaining independence and becoming the sovereign nation that it is today. And he was actually its very first prime minister. So this is a very, very important figure, and that's why we've got this huge statue of him here in this absolutely beautiful area. I don't know if you can see the bird on his head. Uh, there's been a bird on his head ever since we got here, just chilling out. It seems to be a, a hot spot, a good place to have a shit. Not that we want to disrespect Christian. From what I've read of his exploits and everything, it was an absolutely fascinating bit of history. Of course, you're never going to learn that in, uh, unless you're Norwegian, I don't think, or you have this, that kind of an interest. So we're going to catch the bus in a minute. This is where the bus, see buses here, buses arrive here for the airport. So this is our last little taste of Bergen. We've just had a lovely coffee at this little shop here, right there. A coffee and a cigarette before we go. 
nice little look at this. This is absolutely beautiful too. And you've got, of course, those distinctive Bergen Mountains out there in the background. Let's just have a look. Because we haven't been down here the whole time that we've been here. We've actually stayed in a fairly small area. Although I'm so glad we managed to get up Floyan yesterday. I, I don't know if that's how it's pronounced, but incredible. I mean, what a view. Helicopter? What a view of a beautiful little public pond, lake. What do you call this? What do you call this? What would you call this? Yeah. 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 The mountain right there in the background, all these beautiful houses up on uh, Moor Mountain over there, it's surrounded by mountain. Seven mountains, no less. Don't want to go home. They even litter classily. And we heard that the Sith uh, was an amazing thing. Along tree came uh, Rod Hubbard uh, with some songs. Uh, Final Sense sample, remember that one? Yeah. Very, I mean, you played it to death, and when I heard Thing in the Spring, especially, um, you thought it was just some things that would flow over. We, we loaded up that game to just do that drum solo, you know, <laughs> in it. And, um, I was pretty determined from day one, actually, 1983, I think, that I wanted to do music on that computer. And in 84, or when I heard this thing was spring 85, and I was determined to do music for video games and spend every waking hour trying to code. But I didn't have assembly language. I didn't have, I couldn't, I didn't have a cartridge. Didn't have turbo samples, so I just uh, went everywhere to get these things. Like one I got in I think Berlin, it was a okay. cartridge. The one in Amsterdam, like the programmer reference guy. But then, anyway, I was uh, going to these parties, uh, down parties, and uh, I met Charles Dean, yeah. uh, who I found a bit nice with, and I said, oh, come on, you, you can't program this, can you please? And he was already a very simple player, I said, can you build a this effect, a this effect, a this effect, mostly, which were your effects to begin with. <laughs> True. <laughs> but then we had our own player, and then I uh, coded, I think about 10, well, com composed 10 demo songs. We went to the PCW show. And we gave it to Electronic Arts, Ubisoft, and Activision, all of them, and instantly we could use musical video games, they loved it. And mm. that was, uh, the first game I made the music for was Hawkeye when I was 14, so... That's the thank God. And I was with, uh, but the funny thing was, I used to call up Rob since, uh, since I was 13 years old in 1985. <laughs> and we've been talking ever since. <laughs> and every occasion, you know, it's like, so weird. <laughs> and I saw Matt's reaction, like, 14 when making hard Okay, well, that's, that's amazing. Yeah, thank you. So, <laughs> it wasn't amazing at the time, it was something like this. <laughs> uh, so as, you, as I introduced you, you're the godfather of the cover of 64 music. That's nothing you can be taken away from. That's that's how it is. We you're all the hero. And okay, Martin Galway, Matt Douglas, yeah. all respect to them, but you the man. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, and I know that, yes, you started just calling Rob up from, from the, do you remember, do you call that from the first years? Do you get a lot of these kind of calls from German? I made a, like a, when I told you I was putting like these mail out, so yeah. that I did with the demo disc, and um, I had my telephone number and address on there, you know. Yeah. And so eventually my telephone number got out, and then, uh, I would get like crazy phone calls. <laughs> like, you know, I guess some guy calling about four o'clock in the morning from Japan. You know, <laughs> hi Rob. You know what you been doing? Hey man, it's four in the morning. <laughs> of course, in four in the morning in those days is when I'd just gone to bed. You know. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but by the way, uh, about that, uh, you started coding. How did you start coding? Did you use an assembler or just? Basic or an well, when, I, no, when I first got a, a C64, they had this thing called Commodore Basic. Yeah. You so, started off with that one. So you, they, you, you know, used to get the magazines and had all these listings, which were always, always wrong. Yeah. So you, you'd spend a few hours typing this stuff in, and then all it would do is produce a square, 
wobbling across the screen, and then it would crash. Yeah. <laughs> so you were tired of that. So, so, so and then I actually, um, I, I thought, well, well I'm, I'm going to try and write a music player. And so I wrote a music player in basic. And it, it stumbled, stumbled along with like the most horrendous dyslexic rhythm you'd ever heard. <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, this is not good. And then people said, well, you've got a program in assembly language. And that's when I got this thing called Dr. Watson's assembly language tutor of book or something. Okay. And then, um, so I, 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 there was no internet in those days. Yeah. And so I, I, you had to knuckle down, basically. Figure, figure it all out, you know, hexadecimal, binary, exclusive walls and all that stuff, you know. And um, the, I guess the eureka moment for me was when um, I eventually managed to get the um, raster inner of working. Because that's the magic which basically unlocks the Pandora's box to everything you can do. Yeah, you know, with the software in real time. Yeah. You know, that was that was the Pandora's box that um, made everything possible. I also heard that uh, from from a whisper in the audience earlier that you kind of dislike the interrupt handling on PCs for for later work, but that's another story. Uh, IRQ handling from PC coding and uh, the the later things. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, the PC. I just wanted to. I wanted to control the interrupt. I didn't want Microsoft. Get <laughs> <laughs> and Matt, you you came from um, the music background overall, or was it just uh... well only in the my dad had a no, well I lived above a recording studio. My bedroom was above a recording studio. Oh, yeah, you know, it's good, but you'd have one night till about midnight. You'd have this really crap heavy metal band, <laughs> and some nights you'd have a good band there. Yeah, it was cool because at the weekend, no one would be in, so I got to go in and use the synths, little oh. uh, drums or anything, you know. So that was, but that wasn't the spark for it. I've been into music since I could crawl, you know. Yeah. So it was just waiting for something to come along where I could actually get into it, you know, because you couldn't afford a synth, and suddenly this machine came along with the synth chip in it. And yeah. Which, in effect, was, was affordable. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I, and it went barely afford, you know. It's just sort of you haven't got the money, you see, just beg your parents. You know, yeah, I, I think that's quite your, a yeah. common story. <laughs> Likewise, yeah. <laughs> Same as well. And then and on the promise that you're going to make some money out of it one day. Yeah. I, um, I, for once, it was right, but <laughs> it was, you know. I got one of my just uh, my first Commodore 64 just by saying I'm, I'm going to set up all sorts of registers, for my, uh, all our video movies and whatever. All oh, right, that's yeah, yeah, it's going to be that was the, yeah. uh, the thing for me. So it's, it all. Yeah, a different story for everyone. So Jerry, yeah, that was probably when I get sixty-four, I was about fifteen. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, it wasn't to play the games necessarily; it was to listen to the music. You know, to listen to Rob stuff and Martins. So I was just, you know, especially a lot of the Master Tronic games, which you did most of the music for. Yeah. Me, so they were only one ninety-nine, I think. Yeah. Uh, a bunch of games. Well, I had, a, I had a great scam going on because I lived just down the road from like a. A petrol station that sold Master Tronic games. Oh. So I used to go down there on my bike, buy one of the games with his music in, come home, reel to reel, <laughs> take it back, say I picked the wrong game, and give me my money back. Because <laughs> <laughs> he, he didn't have a clue what it was. He thought it, I think he thought it was audio cassettes. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, yeah. I mean, the most electronic games, I remember my dad came home from England, I mean, Sweden, a bit after Computer Wise as well. He came home with The Human Race. Uh, and the, the, yeah. the music with that game was like completely eye opening for me. So it was just. Yeah. So, uh, that's, uh, and, and uh, I mean, I, I used to record all the music over to cassette tapes to bring on later on in the Walkman and stuff like that. And my friends uh, couldn't really, and especially my family couldn't understand. Oh, what's the, this noise? The bleeps and boots. Yeah, yeah. But they got to survive it until now as well. Well, they, they tolerated it. My dad tolerated it. Yeah. Whereas his girlfriend now, she can't. She can't understand it. <laughs> so she has no clue why you. No, which is why I work in headphones all the time. Ah. And if she hears it and says, you know, what's the noise? I say. Uh, 
That's a, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to actually... You, can't, you can't, we were talking earlier about some sort of someone, but you, your brain's either tuned, you like to see it, or you don't. You love it or hate it. Yeah, it's so in between. not really in between, that's very yeah. true. If you think that about the sin, what do you think about the ear wide chip? <laughs> I just hate it. <laughs> but that, that's part of the reason I never carried on, because they made a big mistake with the Amiga by not implementing Sid into it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but, but you basically did music mostly for Commodore 64 only, or? Yeah, and a couple of uh, Nintendo 8-bit okay. ones. And purely because it was 6502 as well. Yeah. But the sound chip on that was, it was okay, but you, it was nowhere near the Sid. And Rob, you've been making music for all sorts of platforms as well, or? Yeah, I, I, um, C64, Spectrum 128, that dreadful Armstrong thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't remember what it was called. It had a green screen. It was just awesome. No, it was called the dreadful. <laughs> <laughs> and um, somehow it made Alan Sugar. God, I, don't I know, it's shocking, isn't it? I don't understand that. How has he got to be? It should have been Clive Sinclair, shouldn't it? And, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, and, uh, and it was politics. Politics. Atari yeah. ST, Amiga, and then when I went to the States, um, the consoles came out, so it was NES and Super NES, and then uh, Sega Genesis, and then PlayStation, and the worst thing was the IBM PC. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that, I mean, that thing was just an absolute nightmare, because there was different formats, so there was a Tandy format, yeah, because there was a Tandy 1000 or whatever it was, and then on the IBM PC there was a beeper. Yeah. <laughs> there was a there was the a speaker. Beeper. What you did for a ski or die or something? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he actually got. Can I tell the story? Yeah. Yeah. No, you tell it. Okay. He actually got a guitar player friend in, yeah. and he like did a guitar solo, yeah. and like he manually. Uh, like tighten every single pitch of that yeah. guitar with, yeah. like, uh, and just to make it sound like a real guitar. Yeah. I actually recorded that. Yeah. <laughs> See, so it's, it's seriously incredible when you hear that. No, the beat that's oh, just oh. unbelievable. Yeah. 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 unbelievable. Yeah. That, that's like a monster, you know. Yeah. But you coded the the players for all the platforms yourself, or did you use? Yeah, no, I did. I did from my own code. Yeah, I coded everything. I mean, I even, eventually on the PC, I implemented. Uh, MIDI driver, okay. so that at least I could then write the music in a format which would then translate down to an analog board and a sound blaster and all the rest of the stuff. But then of the, the ball, like at the end of that, was then the producer would say, Oh, I've got a list of 45 sound effects. <laughs> at which point you just want to blow your brains out. <laughs> Jaron, did you do code your stuff as well later on? Or? Um, yeah, yeah, well. The question was about it. was it like uh, always music, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Was it always music? Uh, well, in my family it always was. Yeah. Like, uh, do you want me to answer the first or the second question? <laughs> Take them in a, in a row. Okay. Or well, you know, combine um, if you want to. Well, my whole family was into music generations, other generations and stuff. Um, for example, my grandfather used to play the piano at the silent movies. Um, he started a pretty famous, apparently. Uh, called choir. My, okay. my father had a choir as well at home. Was the, the conductor there? Okay. And they practiced since I was zero at my house, so it was like uh, it was like natural, you know. And there's always music everywhere. Piano teachers and music teachers and all that. But um, you know, the thing that captured me, like with music, is like I heard I had this Casio watch. I said this last year as well. Mm -hmm. I had this Casio watch and I was eight years old or something. And I hear this tune to come out and very simple FM beeps. And I thought to myself, someone programmed it, I want to do that. But there were no computers. I didn't have a computer around, so I just, I just had to wait for this uh, ZX80, which I borrowed, and it can make a beep command. <laughs> I started beeping around, and I was like, oh, God, the control is ah, I love it. But, uh, then the Commodore 64 came around, and I, I kind of noticed there was something special about this chip, because sometimes I heard sounds coming just from games where they didn't have proper music, you know? Was it like, was some some, some classical music conversions by the programmer, you know, and this is completely wrong. But some things, like from Rob, came out. I was like, what the fuck? There's something to this. And then I got hooked. It was too too full, actually, because you know I didn't have money for a really fancy synthesizer, which were around. You know, they were definitely huge, expensive. 
and uh, well, the computer was the, the the city was the way to go, and you could I could program them so off I went. First in basic actually, yeah. and then I need I, you know he said it as well, Rob said as well. You had to like have machine code, otherwise it couldn't be implemented in the game at all. Yeah. So then later on, I programmed the uh, uh, player on the uh, uh, Nintendo 8-bit NAS. Okay. Uh, also on Amiga, I actually did a fan player on Amiga, but never anything of the music uh, that I made on that was released in the game, unfortunately. Mm. I think I have some the source code laying around that people can have it if they want, but... Um, so that really made it interesting because I had two channels of stereo sound in FM. Yeah, yeah. so that was nice. I mean, that's a quite un unused feature yeah. of the Amiga anyway, but... Yeah. So uh, but the platforms I did was... Uh, well, it's a C64, Nintendo, Nintendo 16-bit, Sega, Mass System, uh, Game Gear, same thing. Um, Sega Genesis, uh, PC. Uh, actually, Philips CDI. I actually CDI did quite, quite some stuff for that. It's a pretty good one, but it's just the, the, the CDI didn't take off much, you know. Um, and I did a lot of these custom games uh, for this, like, Mortal Kombat conversions on this jo uh, game in one joystick. NFL, NHL, uh, also like of course PlayStation and all this stuff. So yeah, just kept going. Yeah, I mean that's that's the beauty of it. Once once you're in there, it just uh, gets bouncing around a bit more. So that's, that's uh, really nice. I mean, um, and um, have you been to? I mean, um, I know that you have been to a lot of demo scene party. What do you guys do? You know anything about the demo scene overall, for instance? Um, I think that the uh, origins of the demo scene, are, I find it quite interesting because that really had a massive impact impact on um, what people were doing on the C64. Yeah. The, um, I used to do games in the mid 80s and uh, these like hacking groups from in Germany yeah. used to send me a copy through the post of the game before it was released <laughs> and um, and they'd already hacked the game so that on the title screen it had got like their logos and they got my music playing and it had got their scrolling messages saying thanks to blah blah blah, blah and um, the um, it, the interesting thing is that that kind of whole thing happened with CompuNet yeah. And people started talking to each other, and, and the, yeah, people started sending demos. I mean, I think I did a couple of demos with bouncing, scrolling messages, oh. and all that kind of stuff, you know, with sprites that big or whatever. You know. <laughs> and um, that kind of like had a really strange influence on like people like um, Iridium and Thalamus, and yeah, yeah. Well, it was it was the first file sharing because we were. People were sending me through CompuNet yeah. all of your tracks, yeah. correct? BDS. Yeah, but, but, so, but it, it, it kind of had a big, inf a massive influence yeah, on, the, on the games and what, what people wanted to try to um, push the envelope of what people were doing. Mm. Not just with music, but with, you know, I've got rid of the border, I've got rid yeah. of the joystick, I've got rid of everything, and uh, this <laughs> thing is just like, you know. A million pixels by a million pixels. How the hell did you do that? You know? there, were, there were some real geniuses on. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, and it kind of like added to that whole thing, which then evolved into what you're talking about as the demo scene. Yeah, indeed. I mean, it basically started by being on the other side of you guys producing commercial games and stuff. Because I mean, in effect, it came from the intros explaining that hey, we have cracked this. And then he kind yeah. of, so it was a bit of a side. I came from the demo scene though. Yeah, you did, which is, yeah. uh, I mean, that's, that, that's also the thing, because I, I mean, there are a lot of things happening from the demo scene these days that actually are influencing the, the whole gaming industry. And the Commodore 64 gaming uh, demo scene is still really huge. And that's also the fun thing, because I mean, it's, there are still games created on the Commodore 64 today which utilizes a lot of these new hacks that, uh, that people have found out, so, so it's been evolving in a way. But yeah. you haven't been to any pure demo scene parties like this? I mean... I went to an Atari one, oh. uh, Atari ST, and these guys were doing just like, absolutely amazing stuff yeah. with the graphics, you know. The music still sucked. <laughs> 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 The Atari ST was only good for one thing, running logic on it to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very true. 
and you just had to be careful because if someone else the other side were moved, the port went, your MIDI went, everything crashed, and uh, someone normally got hurt. So. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and it's it's a always a, a battle between Atari and Commodore overall. So it's, you can notice here. I mean, not that many Atarians here, right? I guess. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 I was kind of tongue in cheek because there were things I did like about Atari. I love the sixty-eight thousand. Yeah. And I like the Atari. Was it the Atari eight hundred? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Pre ST. Yeah. The, the eight-bit yeah. machine was really cool little thing to work on, and they really do cool stuff on that one as well these days. So, so the demo scene is still highly active, especially on on any kind of platform really. So it's, it's good fun. But the Commodore 64 is is actually one of the most thriving uh, scenes of uh, well, sections of the demo scene still. But that's because um, it had the best sound chip. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, I and I mean, the good music from you, all you guys, have been in so many demos and so many intros as well. And, and as I said, been a huge inspiration to to uh, the next generation of uh, musicians. Well, I mean, we have a bunch of musicians here as well who are highly uh, influenced by you guys. So that's, uh, I mean, that's that's a nice legacy for you guys. To have. That yeah. that is the best thing about the demo scene yeah. because at the time, the only feedback you got, if you got any of the software company. They just the music was an add-on for most of them. Yeah, would be a review maybe in one or two magazines. They might mention the music if you're lucky. That was it. There was no idea that people loved the music as much as they did. Was that so was now, aware? That, that was aware. Was that for yourself? Yeah, was aware. Of. But for YouTube and seeing the comments on there, I would never have known. Yeah. So I'd have, I'd have happily well, I'd have, I'd have gotten to my grave not knowing that anyone <laughs> even liked anything you ever did. Yeah. So. So, but, so that's great. That's Speaking of that, do you YouTube yourselves? Do you do searches for yourselves about your music and to see Never, never. Um, <laughs> what, what a really <laughs> vain thing to do. <laughs> I actually... I do, I do. I've, it's fun to watch, man. It's I'm being the, sarcastic. So. <laughs> I know that. So, so. Because I've been doing some orchestral scores of some of my old stuff, I've actually, you know, it's quicker to go on YouTube and then do, you know, YouTube yeah. to MP3 to get it from YouTube and then, you know, you suddenly say, bloody hell, there's like 100,000 bloody hits or something on this, you know. Yeah. And um, there's some pretty good comments on, on there, you like, <laughs> you scroll through, you know. Yeah. But, yeah, you've got that and you've got all the, all the, the retro sites, they've got comments and reviews on games and things. So it's more feedback 30 years on than you ever saw. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, throughout basically um, up until about maybe 10 or 15 years ago, I had no idea. Absolutely yeah, not. Roughly the same. Yeah, yeah internet has helped in that yeah. respect. Yeah. 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 No idea. With me, it was the same, uh, I, but I was aware of it as I was in the demo scene. I heard it back through those, but it was just very limited, basically. Sometimes I got like some post in the mail or something like that. So <laughs> to Charles or something. You got a little Yeah. Good yeah. uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's great. Yeah. Mostly to Charles because his address was... I just got tax it. bills. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's illegal though. <laughs> um, now, the, when the internet came to me, I was working at Funcom well, at some point. Two guys from Funcom here, by the way, ex Funcom. But um, and I created this email address, Runtel at e email dot com or something. Okay. And all of a sudden, this bills cut pouring in. Just like, what the fuck is this? It was really, really interesting to see, actually. Yeah, but it's, uh, with the feedback you get now on YouTube, especially, it's like uh, I actually search my name to see if there's remixes. Ah, and there are really cool ones. Yeah, I mean, people are doing lots of interesting stuff remix-wise as well. And I mean, uh, speaking of uh, orchestral stuff, by the way, you guys, and Robin and Jerome, you did the C64 Orchestra a while back, right? Yeah, oh, well, well, I went to it. I didn't do anything on it. <laughs> I mean, the um, C64 yeah. Orchestra, what, yeah. did, what was that? It was 2006. Yeah. Oh, no, I didn't go to that. What are you talking about the? Um, uh, oh, no, I, just, uh, yeah. I was together with my VJ and we uh, decided four o'clock at night after a gig that uh, maybe it would be cool to have a orchestra play uh, the Commodore 64 music. Uh, actually, just mine. But then I thought I remembered from conversations like 
uh, when I was 15, I started calling him, uh, that he said that he orchestrated stuff on music script. And so I called him up uh, and asked, did you do it? Yeah, and, uh, the, the, you talk about the Run 64 or something. Yeah, Run 10. Run 10, run 10 yeah. Was it? Oh. Yeah, let's go, go to 20 and run 10 or something. <laughs> then he said, so whilst you're at it and you want to do it, can you please like do half of the songs of yours yeah, yeah, as well? Yeah. And then we just, the production house of East Netherlands uh, paid for it. We couldn't use a full orchestra because we had, they had to tour with it, you know? Yeah. With the Bible, we ended up with 12 musicians from the Ricciotti Ensemble and one uh, the conductor. Yeah. And Rob uh, arranged all, everything on the music yeah. Yeah. That's how it came to be. And he came to the Netherlands, which was awesome. We got to hang out in Amsterdam and stuff. Oh, yeah. The, the, the vent now and... Uh, yeah. It, it was another place, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. But it's, uh, yeah, so, so that's how it came to be. And it toured all, of, all, all over the Netherlands and all the big venues, actually. That's quite cool. Yeah, it was. So what's the beginning of that? Yeah. And, and it's the, a bit different now than with with your the, the newer symphonic versions of your your stuff as well. Yeah, we, there was a concert in Hull. Yeah. Back in June, which was uh, quite an event. Yeah. A lot of people were were yeah, there from here. Just. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So a ton of work went into that. There's just loads of people involved, and um, it, it was quite amazing that we actually pulled it off. Yeah. <laughs> Even though the elbow player came in a bar early, Monty on the room. <laughs> Darn it! Well, it's kind of funny how it is interconnected because in April, that former that year, the same year, yeah. uh, there was. Uh, uh, competition from the Richard, Richard Ensemble, yeah, uh, yeah. which is like a vlog, so I, they had the competition to remix uh, my 8-bit music, either Nintendo or Gold yeah. 64, and uh, the winner of that, because it was just, and it was full ox as well, yeah. the winner of that, Alistair Pickering, 21 years old, we didn't know anything, brilliant guy, sent him to them, yeah. he's a good arranger, let him help you on the whole project, yeah. and so it came to be like within days, uh, Alistair was already arranging for this uh, whole yeah. concert, yeah. and you loved this guy, right? Yeah. You talk to him and it's like, okay, within like five minutes, you know that this guy is the real deal. He knows what he's talking about, you know. And um, he did a fantastic job. And uh, I think the guy's going to have a fantastic career. Yeah. It's a good, good starting point. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, the good guy's a fucking um, genius. Yeah, yeah. And he's modest as well. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. He's a really good guy. Um, we did a Kickstarter back in. Um, August. Uh, August the 9th, yeah. and um, so that's when it started to, to record the uh, tracks with a real orchestra, mm -hmm. and that's happening in February the 18th. That's nice. In Prague? Yeah, in Prague with the, the mm -hmm. Czech Studio Orchestra, mm -hmm. which is what the BBC uses for a lot of its stuff. Um, Fucking genius. <laughs> so uh, that's actually 83 pieces I come to. <laughs> that's, that's I mean, could you imagine your tracks that you made in the mid '80s sounding anything like with a, a fully symphonic arrangement? Not really, because I thought we were going to be in the bargain bin. That's true. It, it's, it's, it's <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, um, even back then, you, you're always trying to. Um, Come up with something different, come up with something new, and some of them were obviously a bit more kind of, you know, um, uh, orchestral um, influence, yeah. shall we say. I mean, something just wouldn't work. I, I did like a game called um, Delta. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was, I was excited, I can't remember, but it used the Prokofiev thing that they always use on The Apprentice. Yeah. You know oh that? yeah, no, that's sanctioned. Yeah, that's in the. Was that sanctioned? Or that yeah, that was the title music. Yeah, the, you know the famous. Yeah, yeah. The famous thing that the Prokofiev wrote. The thing was Delta. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's the title. 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 No, no. What is that one? Anyway, the thing with Delta is that. I mean, that works. And then there was another thing where um, the, I think Gary Lydon wanted me to try to do. Um, a piece by Gustav Holt oh. called Mars, and you know I already had the orchestral score to that, so I'm um, like, trying to do things, and it just it was never going to work. And I just you know there's some things would just would work, and some things would definitely not work. And that was <laughs> one of them. So you had to make these kind of judgments. Yeah. You know. 
I mean, uh, we can clearly hear some hard rock influences from uh, the last the session yesterday from uh, uh, Last Ninja 2, because I think that, Matt, when you did the music for Last Ninja 2, you had a sort of a metal style in, in mind, or? That is a myth. Uh, it is, ah. right. It's an urban myth. Yeah. Some of them, yeah. like tracks like The Sewers, mm -hmm. but no, I had this conversation with Yarl, and yeah. a lot of those really fast, complicated guitar parts he plays were meant for a synth. Yeah, so it's he's great. He can play. Yeah, it's so, so great. It's great. Anyway, do that. It's amazing. But no, it was always a hybrid sound for me. It was never one thing. It was never rarely orchestral, synth rock, anything. I don't. I'm not into one genre of music. I like I'm the best of everything. So I like Man. hybrid sound. So um, so yeah. No, lot, but it's interesting that lots of people. That's what they heard. So it's great, if that's, that's the way they heard it, that's the way they heard it, and it's just great that they liked it. Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't care if they're hearing it as, you know, the birdie song or whatever it is. <laughs> um, if they like it, it's great, because that's what music's for, it should, you know, if it doesn't move you, then you move on or something else, you know, so, yeah. I mean, you could hear that in the remix combo today as well, I mean, lots yeah. of different twists and takes of... Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, so... I, I think that's quite healthy, actually.